Uh, right, and I'm going to talk the yeah, natural search for SUSY breaking or uh, models where SUSY is broken at a low scale uh, through boundary conditions in uh, TV sized extra dimensions. And this is based on some recent work with Savis, John Marsh Russell, and some of John's students. Okay, so let me just set kind of the general stage for this work. Uh, here we are on the eve of 13 TV LHC collisions, and what did we learn? from the first run of the LHC? Well, first we have some uh, fairly robust limits on colored superpartners coming from the LHC. So squarks and guinos uh, greater than around one and a half to two TeV, depending on the spectrum. Uh, stops and spottoms uh, heavier than six or 700 TeV. Uh, and also some rough limits on pink zeno, so that's a little bit more spectrum dependent, uh, around 300 TeV. Well, I mean, all of spectrum. Yeah, it's all spectrum dependent. <laughs> so, uh, these limits are getting fairly, there's not too much parameter space to squeeze around that. Is, but yes, of course, there are ways to get around all this stuff. There's ways to have stops at 400 GV still. But, uh, and blue looks as light as 500. <laughs> yeah, yes. So, right, and yeah, in fact, there are kind of two ways to respond to these limits on, so these are limits on you know, kind of the generic singles of missing energy uh, and chets and leptons, right? And of course, there are. Uh, two ways you can respond to this. You can look at uh, parts of MSM parameter space or extensions of MSM where these normal signatures are hidden. And there's been a lot of fruitful model building work in this direction uh, over the past few years. And also a lot of uh, good experimental work on covering these uh, missing ends. Uh, or there's another direction you go is just uh, accept that the, our, some of the super partners are significantly heavier than the weak scale. So there is some type of little hierarchy between the weak scale and the massive super partners. Uh, so I'm going to focus on uh, this latter case in this talk on uh, are there, uh, is there anything we can do to reduce or increase the naturalness of having this little hierarchy? Uh, though I'll talk a little bit about some interesting uh, ideas that this also spawned for uh, these kinds of approaches of hiding the super partners. OK, uh, and then one other important bit of information that we've uh, learned is that there is a standard model like Higgs uh, that's been discovered. Uh, and by certain all like, I mean we know uh, a fair bit about its branching ratios and production cross-section, and kind of deviations at order 10% start to be constrained uh, by current data. And we know that it's at a mass of 125 GeV. Okay, so this says two things, that we'd like to have models where there's some type of natural decoupling limit, where we get a single Higgs doublet looking standard model uh, over some energy range. Uh, and uh, if we're going to do this in MSM, then either we need uh, large rate of corrections or the usual uh, extensions to get the right Higgs mass. Okay, so that's where we stand right now, and hopefully we'll turn on the LHC uh, and see uh, super partners at 2.5 TV or 2 TV, right? Okay. Okay, so the question I want to ask is: Is this little hierarchy, so having some of the super partners of masses significantly larger than the weak scale, uh, a little hierarchy problem in the sense of uh, does this necessarily lead to a tuning uh, in the parameters of the theory? Okay, so you know the naivest thing you could do, and uh, it's, it's kind of write down these natural supersymmetry models where I have uh, squirts and glinos at, at sitting at their limit and stops sitting at their limit, uh, and I can ask, you know, in the normal MSSM framework, is this a tuned spectrum or not? Right. Uh, of course, I, I, right. So this has been studied in a great deal, and kind of the uh, framework is there is some tuning, but it depends on what scale, uh, what is the messenger scale in these models. So, how large are loops connecting these masses together, right? Uh, so, in some sense, the just naive uh, natural spectrum for M7 is not tuned. That if I put the messenger scale at a TeV, then the radio corrections from Glinos and uh, from third generation scores to Higgs. I uh, don't generate a Higgs potential where I have to tune the parameters. Okay. Uh, however, uh, we know that in uh, most models of uh, SUSY breaking mediation, so in the typical MSM hidden sector uh, plus messenger framework, we have a scale deviation that's greater than around 100 TeV, and then already uh, you get a tuning of around 10%. Uh, and in fact, if you look at how SUSY breaking is communicated in uh, greater detail in, a, in some realistic models, uh, it's you're looking at models that are mostly tuned to around a few percent level right now with these bounds. Okay, so that's the state in the MSSM. 
so uh, what the models look at today are uh, going to solve this problem primarily through taking the messenger scale and bringing it down to a TEV. And the idea is that these models don't have any regime uh, where they look like the MSSM with softly broken supersymmetry. So that's how these models solve this problem. And the particular kind we're going to look at is uh, models where there's an extra dimension of size approximately uh, order 1 over 4 TV or a little bit larger. Uh, and the propagation of some of the MSSM states in this bulk uh, will uh, give you SUSY breaking through the boundary conditions on the brains at either end. So this is the shared Schwartz mechanism for SUSY breaking. Uh, so in particular, uh, we'll like to do this natural spectrum, and having an extra dimensional theory gives you a simple way to realize uh, separation scales between different superpartner masses, right? So we can localize a third generation on one of the brains so that they don't propagate in the bulk. And so already at tree level, you'll set up this natural spectrum uh, that we like to have. Okay. Uh, and so these models have been studied uh, in the early 2000s, uh, similar kinds of models by uh, Delgado, Carmel, Kiros, Sardis, uh, and uh, Berkeley group also. Uh, so kind of the new bits of information we have now are we know what the limits are on the superpartners. Uh, we know that we need to make the Higgs sector work for 125 GeV Higgs. Uh, and we've gone uh, and studied uh, in detail some more of the phenomenology related uh, to actually getting successful electronic symmetry breaking in these models. Okay, so some things that will be important is that since I have a 5D theory, uh, a 5D gauge theory, there's uh, going to have to be some low-scale UV completion of this model. So if one of our is around 1 over 4 TV, then the fundamental scale of the 5D gauge theory is around 50 TV. Uh, so at some point, this will need to be completed into a gravitational theory that uh, solves this extra M star to M Planck uh, difference. And we'll talk about some interesting things that can happen uh, when you do that. Uh, okay, so the outline of the rest of the talk is I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. So that's, you know, that's the overall model that's talking about. Uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about how uh, this setup really does a good job of setting up this natural spectrum uh, and protecting it from radiative tuning uh, and some of the interesting uh, contrasts from the regular MSSM setup. Uh, then I'll talk in a little bit more detail about the collider phenomenology, which will be dominated by the production of these third generation brain states. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about an interesting direction you can go with this. It's kind of motivated by these models, though a little bit more generic, of looking at the collider phenomenology of decays to states that might live in a large, uh, so an additional large, uh, large extra dimensional gravitational bulk uh, that would solve the ratio between this fundamental scale and the Planck scale. Okay, so let's dive into how you get a natural spectrum from geography in these models. So there's a few different ways of describing how uh, this shared force twist uh, breaks, super, breaks supersymmetry. So you can describe it in terms of radion mediation. You can describe it in terms of boundary conditions. You can describe it as a uh, S1 mod Z2 cross Z2 orbital. And the case we're going to focus on is the maximal shared force twist, which is most simply described just by uh, specifying the Dirichlet and Neumann uh, boundary conditions for the fields. Uh, so what we will want to do is take all the standard model fields that are living in the bulk and give them uh, even boundary conditions on both the uh, y equals zero and y equals pi r brain, uh, so that we get zero modes for these fields and we'll have the standard model left over as our zero modes. Uh, then uh, we can do the normal thing in 5D models, which is that you know normally you take an n equals two 5D model to an n equals one uh, 4D SUSY model by taking a Z2 orbifold. Right, so you can break one of the supersymmetries by doing this. Uh, uh, so we'll give uh, odd boundary conditions to some of the fields on the pi r brain. Right, so that will lift one of the gauge genome superpowers. So in n equals two, uh, in five D minimal supersymmetry, the uh, so for instance the standard model uh, gauge bosons have not just one but two superpowers. Uh, so two gauge geno superpowers, a gauge geno and a conjugate gauge geno and then also an extra scalar super partner. So we'll choose boundary conditions that lift all of these guys. So uh, boundary conditions at the pi r brain will lift one gauge geno, uh, and boundary conditions at the zero brain uh, will lift the other gauge geno, and then this scalar will be lifted by both. And then, of course, uh, in this 5D setup, there's a full KK tower for all of these states. Uh, which kind of boundary conditions are you using to explain or normally? Uh, for, for which field? 
all three of those, which... What's such plus and minus mean? Plus means even, minus means uh, odd. Or plus means uh, vanishing derivative, minus means vanishing uh, value. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll do this. And so I said I was going to put the Higgs gauge and first and second family in the bulk, and I'll choose boundary conditions that uh, leave their zero modes. Uh, I can think of the guys that have also even boundary conditions at the zero brain and vanishing boundary conditions over here as the MSM partners, so my normal MSM partners, and then I'll have a set of n equals 2 partners that are additionally present in the spectrum, uh, and these will be, uh, for uh, be like Dirac partners of the gauge uh, And then I'm going to put the third generation on the brain, on this y equals 0 brain, uh, the third generation matter, uh, and because it's not propagating in the bulk at tree level, it doesn't know anything about boundary conditions, uh, and will uh, at tree level have a supersymmetric spectrum. Okay, so to summarize, at tree level, what I've obtained is I have a spectrum of superpartners where my third generation uh, spermions and my uh, Higgs scalars are uh, massless because they're zero modes. And I have a degenerate spectrum of uh, first and second family spermions, gay genos, Higgs genos, and their n equals two partners all at one of one over two r. Okay, so this is what I've obtained at tree level. Uh, so the spermions are protected by locality. They live on the brain, so they don't feel the bulk Susie breaking. Uh, the Higgs are protected because I've chosen boundary conditions to make them a zero mode. Uh, and something already that's pretty interesting in these models, I'm very un MSSM like, is that. I have a zero mode for my scalars, for my scalar Higgses, and I have my Higgsinos lifted to one over two R, uh, but I don't have any tree level tuning for this. So I've, there's no contribution to the Higgs scalar masses that goes like the Higgsino mass squared. Whereas the usual case in MSM, I lift the Higgsinos with the mu term, uh, and I automatically generate a contribution to the scalar potential like mu squared uh, for the Higgs. So this is a uh, kind of a unique property of these 5D models. Of course, there are other models where you get uh, Higgsinos separated. So Marcus recently wrote down a model where you separate Higgsinos uh, from uh, their scalars. Uh, but it's a yeah, it's kind of an interesting nice feature. There aren't very many examples of uh, how to do this. Okay, so sometimes you get direct and universal soft masses for the bulk states, uh, and you get uh, for the Gaginos and Higgsinos, they're actually uh, Dirac masses paired up with their n equals two partners for this case of maximal twist. Uh, and one extra nice feature is that this combination of having the leading contributions being uh, flavor universal and the uh, having an R symmetry from these. Uh, in fact, you have a full R symmetry in the spectrum, and this protects you from a lot of the leading Suzy flavor problems in these models. Uh, so actually, the leading flavor problems as models come from. Uh, brain localized operators in, as usual in 85D uh, model. <coughs> and also from uh, the fact that I've, because I've put the third generation on the brain, I have an explicit uh, extra flavor spirion. Uh, so these give you interesting, but for the scales, uh, this is, so for one of our around 4 or 5 TV, uh, interesting, uh, perhaps future observables, but uh, right now safe from flavor. Okay, so that's how you get a natural spectrum at tree level. Of course, Susan Brayton is going to be communicated to these zero modes at loop level. Uh, and so what is it about shared Schwartz that uh, protects you? You know, in a sense, I've chosen boundary conditions that are hard breaking of Suzy. Uh, so it looks like you know, this should be sensitive to scales all the way up to the fundamental scale. Uh, so what is going on is that the way I've chosen boundary conditions, I've actually only broken uh, my 5D supersymmetry is n equals 2 from the 40 percent. So there's two separate supercharges. And I've only broken a single supercharge at either brain. So at each brain, there is a uh, locally a good supersymmetry. Uh, so you, know, you can see this directly from just looking at the boundary conditions I chose. You know, I've chosen uh, the same boundary condition for a gauge boson and a gauge geno partner here. So that forms a, a gauge multiplet. And a gauge geno and its uh, scalar partner uh, have minus boundary conditions here. And that will form a chiral multiplet. Uh, so there's a good n equals one supersymmetry here, and there's a orthogonal but also good n equals one supersymmetry where I've paired the gauge boson with the other uh, gauge you know over here. So everywhere there's always one good supersymmetry. So it's only globally in this uh, uh, theory that I have broken all of the supersymmetry. 
So what will this do? Well, when I'm looking at SUSE breaking loops, uh, loops that communicate SUSE breaking to zero modes will have to propagate from the y equals zero to the y equals pi r brain, and so they'll actually be exponentially suppressed uh, above uh, this scale one over r. So you really get an exponential cutoff in SUSE breaking effects, and it's like you have a very low messenger scale. Okay, uh, so then what will happen is I have uh, my spermions and Higgs zero modes, massless at tree level. At one loop, they, dominantly the gate genomes will feed into uh, the mass of these, so I'll get an electroweak contribution from coupling to the bulk gate genomes to the Higgs zero modes, and I'll get dominantly an SU3 contribution uh, to the, uh, in particular I'm caring about the stop and spot and masses of the third generation states. Uh, right, and these uh, follow the similar kind of formula, and just to emphasize what you're winning here, uh, you know, if you look at the one loop uh, formulas for uh, superpartner masses, you know, there'll be proportional gauge coupling squared, and you have this log of your messenger scale. For 100 kV, there's a factor of 10. Uh, for gut scale, there's a factor of you know, 50 to 100, really, it's a running calculation. Uh, but the fundamental point is that this will be an order one factor, in fact, a little bit smaller than order one. So you gain, this is where you're winning in tuning in these small set. You just, you don't have, you only have a finite contribution uh, radiatively, so I will preserve my large tree level hierarchy. And so I will win in tuning by about a factor of 10 compared to, you know, my gauge mediation at 100 TV. So can, can you say a little more about, sorry, just to be slow, but. Yeah. Uh, um, why the third generation is localized and the first two generations are in the bulk? What's the advantage of that? So the advantage is that you set up uh, a natural SUSE spectrum where the stops, uh, so it's, yeah, it's phenomenology driven that we have better limits on the first two generation uh, spermons than we do on the third generation spermons. So my, if I want to maximize tuning my naturalism model well, uh, being compatible with experimental limits, then I'm okay with making the first two generations heavy. Uh, and in fact, that helps me with experimental limits, but I want to keep the third generation uh, light and just above the lower bounds on that. It seems like you could have imagined doing it the other way around, right? I mean, uh, so the, the point is you're saying you want to separate their masses, right? Their stops from the first two generation. Uh, yeah, I want the stops to be at 700 GV where that limit is, and the squirks and blue nose to be at 2 TV where that yeah, limit is. You want to a little higher than the problem, right? The, yes. The yeah. stops are kept yeah. high. So, so, sorry, maybe this is a stupid question, but could you do it the other way around? Could you have put the stops in the bulk and had there, and had a, you know, could you, and then had the first two generations on the brain? Uh, you could do that. Then you would have a very heavy stop. Uh, and Why? It's so because if because the stops really are, is just set by the radius, right? Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. So if the stop, if you put the stops in bulk, then they get a massive one return. Okay. Well, there's so in folded Susie, yeah. you put the stops in bulk and get around this in a, a different way, but that's a more elaborate model building exercise. Mm -hmm. So where are your uh, I've lost track of the scales? Mm -hmm. uh, where are your first uh, KK graviton? That we would have eventually. Graviton excitation. Yeah, so that will so depend forth. on the yeah, that will depend on the UV completion for the gravity sector. Right. So if you do some type of little string theory or RS completion, uh, where there really is a regime where it looks like just a <coughs> 5D gravitational theory, then the first KK modes are at one over R for the gravitational sure. sector also. However, you might imagine doing something like a large extra dimension UV completion, uh, and then you'll have a for just for the gravitational sector. So then you have a 5D brain world with a uh, gravitational states that could be at much lower scales. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, actually. Okay, good. So, summary is, we're going to win in tuning by bringing uh, this fact that the loops, the shirk schwartz uh, radio corrections are very soft because of locality and the fact that loops have to stretch all the way across the sector mentioned to communicate Susie breaking uh, will win us a factor of uh, at least 10 uh, in tuning compared to uh, kind of more standard gauge mediation models. So even if you put a third generation in the bulk, can you make a light just picking the boundary condition to be? Minimal? If you make yeah, if you make the third generation uh, spermion light, then you'll make the fermion heavy, and that we don't want to do. Mm -hmm. 
So we, we want to, because you, you want to, you always have to choose boundary conditions that keep as zero modes the standard model fields. Right, so oh. you, yeah, if you extend the field, yeah, if you extend the field content model, then I can choose boundary conditions that do essentially what you said, and that 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 gives you a full decision model. So you have to extend the uh, global symmetries of the model to do that. So you, you add extra states in the stop sector mm -hmm. to do that. Right, yeah, yeah. Because the, my choice of boundary conditions for the standard model top is connected to, by the parity operation I find to the choice of boundary conditions for the scalar partners. So it's, it, it's yeah, it's not possible in a simple way to do that. Okay, so to put in numbers, what does this win me? So when I look at uh, plug in numbers to these formulas, what I'll get is that there is a built-in hierarchy between the mass scale entering the Higgs potential, so soft masses uh, generated by coupling to the bulk gauge genos for the Higgs, of a factor of 30 below the scale one over R. <clears throat> so this means that for the weak scale to be totally natural, one over R should be around 4 TeV. So where does the one over 30 come from? Or? So that comes from uh, small log, loop factor, and gauge couplings. Good, okay. Well, by small log, I mean this really a finite factor when you do the coverage. Um, okay, and not only do I get a natural hierarchy between the weak scale and the scale one over R, I also get a nice feature in uh, natural SUSY models that I like to have, which is I have a separation between the stops and the Golinos that is preserved at loop level. Uh, so I get uh, that the stop, uh, the rarely generated stop mass is one tenth one over R, or uh, one fifth of the tree level Golino mass that I have. So this is a feature that's pretty hard to maintain in any model where I have any running from a messenger scale. Usually I have these uh, within a factor of two of each other. And the difference between 1 over 30 and 1 over 10 is just G versus G strong? Or? Yeah, it's color factor and G strong. Yeah. Okay, so I've told you what the overall scale for electric symmetry breaking can be, but there's the other question is, do I uh, actually get electric symmetry breaking these models? So right now what I've described is a single parameter model, just 1 over R, sets all of the scales and all of the particle masses. Uh, and in this model, you're not going to get electric symmetry breaking. So you get close, but not quite. So what happens is you have this uh, large one-loop electroweak contribution to the Higgs soft mass that's positive. Uh, at two loops, uh, you have contributions through the stop sector, so stop, uh, Galeno, two-loop diagrams that also feed into the Higgs sector. Uh, and those get a negative contribution that is comparable, uh, but not quite big enough to drive electroweak symmetry breaking. Uh, uh, so you end up with, uh, overall, the scale for the Higgs potential is right, but you need some extra contribution to drive electric symmetry breaking. So are there any possible extra contributions? Uh, and there are several possibilities. Let me tell you about one. Okay, so one uh, extra possible source of contributions to the Higgs potential uh, is that I haven't said anything about how this TV size extra dimension is stabilized. Uh, I'm not gonna, so uh, there are many different possibilities for having stabilized stabilize this extra dimension, but it's a fairly uh, common possibility that when you try to stabilize this extra dimension and get a vanishing uh, 4D cosmological constant, uh, you need to add an extra source of SUSY breaking localized on one of the brains uh, to uh, uh, to tune the CC away. Right? So uh, this you know, could generically be present, and so we should worry about does this feed in to our spectrum for our other states. Uh, and the scale for this contribution is set, so there's kind of an irreducible contribution to the uh, radion potential, which is this Casimir energy uh, that I generate from these boundary conditions, from Susie breaking boundary conditions, that goes like uh, roughly one over pi over four. Uh, so this sets the scale for these extra contributions, this extra source of Susie breaking that might be present. Uh, so you get, uh, you may have these Brinlogas F terms that are, uh, have values order uh, one over pi r squared. Uh, and these could, because I have a low fundamental scale in these theories, uh, these could couple in uh, through higher dimensional operators, so some x dagger x, q dagger q, uh, killer operator uh, in the usual way, but it's suppressed by this fundamental scale m star, which is only 50 or 100 TV. Uh, so these can be phenomenologically important, right? And it turns out that the size of these contributions, uh, if you put in these uh, 
rough numbers is around 1 20th one over r. So this is much smaller than the tree level masses I got for uh, the bulk states. Uh, but is, uh, for the brain localized states, this is kind of comparable to the loop masses. Uh, now for the Higgs, you get a smaller contribution because there's an additional volume suppression. Uh, so it turns out the most phenomenologically relevant things are that I will perturb the, spe the spectrum of third generation states uh, by including these operators. Does, yep. does this bring back the flavor problem? Do some other kinds of operators? Yeah, so you can uh, have power? you can have uh, arbitrary flavor structure in these operators, and because uh, because you are uh, your dominant uh, contribution for the first two generations is a large value, and you have uh, an approximate R symmetry, uh, you're still safe with Susie <coughs> Susie <layer processes. coughs> yeah, and, and because one of our is right, you have the scores already fairly large universal mass, and this is a small perturbation on it for the first two generations. And if they're at uh, four TeV, and this is hundreds of TeV, that's really okay. Because you said something about the R symmetry. Is there an additional? Yeah, the R, so the R symmetry suppresses uh, some of the more dangerous observables. So yeah, it's a combination of these two things that you have an approximate SU2 flavor and you have an R symmetry. How does the R symmetry help? I mean, because you still have the same. Uh, there's only so much. I mean. The squark mass matrices are, are neutral, right? Yeah, so the, some of the most dangerous processes need a chirality flip, and when you have an R symmetry, then the chirality flip uh, takes uh, those, you. Okay, those are, those are essentially always suppressed, but right? no, the chirality flip <coughs> is I mean, at least very Yeah, but they're, they're much more suppressed when you have a Dirac, mm -hmm. when you have a UNR, because then you have to go back mm -hmm. uh, out of the R symmetry. Okay, I, guess I'm just a, right, I guess I'm a little surprised that just the standard mixing frames are, are sufficiently small. But. Yeah, it, it's, it's coming from, yeah, you, you have this combined protection. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, the thing is, if you're assuming, you could assume that you have anarchy in these X X, in these perturbations of soft spectrum, uh, but you to make a 5D model work, we have sterile in the bulk, uh, you have to assume there's some flavor structure in the brain localized kinetic terms. So I've already assumed that there's some flavor structure in the brains. Uh, just from purely the 5D flavor limits. Okay, good. So these are going to give me uh, contributions to the soft masses of the third generation states, which I brain localized, uh, that are comparable to the one loop contributions I had from the pure Schwartz shorts. Model. Uh, and this, yeah, so there's some uh, other options. So I could have also, uh, if these aren't present or if these have suppressed couplings to a standard model, uh, then there are other ways you could drive electric symmetry breaking if you put in some extra bulk states, uh, brain localized dynamics for the Higgs, uh, or you quasi localize some of the states. Uh, and yeah, those are most of what I'll say will apply to you in kind of any way you do this. Uh, okay, so once I have these extra contributions, I can make the stop a little bit heavier, uh, and that will feed in uh, through to the Higgs potential and uh, drive electric symmetry breaking. So you just have to make the stop a little bit heavier than its uh, one loop stretch towards mass, and you get successful like, tweak symmetry breaking. Okay. So you couldn't just also just have a direct contribution to the Higgs soft mass. Uh, a direct contribution to Higgs. Yeah, you can do. Uh, what do you mean a direct contribution? Oh, like through these X to yeah. X. Yeah, that you can do that. That turns out to be sublead. If you put in the NDA mm -hmm. estimates, that is suppressed further by the. Uh, wave function overlap of the Higgs with oh. the brain, mm -hmm. right? So it turns out that the radius thing is actually a little bit bigger than that. So it's okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So to summarize, uh, what is the spectrum uh, we're going to be looking at? And what do we get uh, from this picture of Sherrick Schwartz plus a little uh, extra source of Susie breaking? Uh, so we have all of our KK states uh, and n equals two super partners at around four TeV or uh, scale one over R. Uh, and we have uh, gate genos, pink genos, and first and second family surnames that get a large tree level uh, universal shared Schwartz mass. And so there are loop corrections to this, but this is the dominantly what's setting the scale. Uh, for these. So these guys are roughly degenerate at one over R of around 2 TeV. Okay, then at one loop, I generated uh, masses for my third generation surnames that are order a uh, few hundred GeV. 
uh, or you know, order 20 for 30th of the scale one over r. Uh, and then I have these extra contributions that can, in principle, mix up the spectrum. So the overall scale is still about the right size. So these are contributions that are similar in size to my one loop uh, corrections. Uh, but they're not predictive in that they're coming from these higher dimensional operators. So you could imagine kind of any spectrum for these third generation states. Uh, okay, so that's the spectrum. Uh, that's what we've accomplished by with this model building of putting the part of the MSM in that fifth dimension and having Susie breaking tied explicitly uh, to this extra dimension. Uh, okay, so one other thing I haven't talked about yet is we know we have 125 GB Higgs. How do we get that in this model? So in these models, uh, nothing special happens that helps you compare to the MSM uh, in a large way. So there are some uh, small advantages, uh, but overall, uh, the simplest thing to do. So the simplest thing to do is just have radially generate the Higgs mass. Uh, you can uh, naturally go to a large time beta limit in these models where you actually uh, completely make the H down an inert doublet. So this is different than the MSM and use higher dimensional operators to uh, realize the down like power couplings. Uh, so this is kind of nice that you can really, uh, kind of in a simple way, uh, realize the large time beta limit. Um, also, I have Dirac Eugenos in these models, but I don't have the usual effect where I uh, remove the d -term contributions to the Higgs potential. So uh, I, didn't, I didn't get, I don't think I got your point about large time beta. You're saying that, why, why is it, it's, it's natural here, why? Uh, <coughs> yeah, so I, I, yes, so I, I can take a, yes, I can take a 10 beta that goes to infinity limit in the MSM. Uh, there's a different, you can take a 10 beta that goes to infinity limit where it's really, the down, H down is just not playing any role in electric symmetry breaking, so it doesn't get a bad in these models. So you can take a different kind of 10 beta that goes to infinity limit. How is it different? I mean, how, how is it different? So the down like you call couplings aren't gener don't have to be generated through couplings to H down. They can be generated through uh, non holomorphic terms because I have a low scale. Uh, okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, good question. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and one other nice feature is that if you know if I just get the Higgs mass by making the stop heavy, then I will have comparably low tuning compared to other models in this model. Uh, but so, so I from what you just said, which is that you have rather non standard model like couplings to some of the quarks. This kind of you would have non-MSM like couplings to some of the squirks. Only the squirks? Yeah, not quarks? Yes. Not the, yeah, the quarks you would, is standard model like. Let's see, what's protecting the quark couplings here? Uh, so, so, when you, so yeah, you, when you do this, you can write down a extra operator and a killer potential, and that will gives you a normal uh, you call a coupling, but different couplings and superparameters. So it's a Susie breaking operator that couples H up dagger to, uh, the, to the quarks to give you the normal down like you call it couplings. But it, it's, only, yeah, it's only when you start using the super partners that looks, the, the structure of the colors becomes different. Um, but yeah, so that's not a crucial part of the models, but it's just a nice thing you can do in these models. Um, okay, so then the simplest thing I can do, of course, is to just radially generate the Higgs mass. I don't have A terms in these models. Uh, so if I do have the large time beta limit, and I have the D terms. So what that means is stops will be somewhere between three and uh, eight TeV. Uh, you have the usual uncertainty in new color couplings and the higher order corrections uh, to get 125 GeV Higgs radiatively. Uh, or I have the other option that I can uh, do the usual MSM solution to this problem of including some extended Higgs sector coupling to the Higgs to generate extra contributions. Uh, so singlet extension, vector-like matter, or gauge extensions. Uh, all of these end up giving you uh, roughly, so we, we studied all these, uh, you end up not getting uh, significant extra contributions to the tuning of these models. So you do get extra contributions in the soft masses when you do these kinds of things. Uh, but because we have uh, this low scale cutoff, uh, it's also a nice feature that uh, you can correct the Higgs cortic without generating new uh, contributions to the soft masses. In this model. So, just to show you some results, I'll just focus on the case where you have a U1 prime extension and have non decoupling D terms that lift the Higgs mass out to give you that extra little bit. What's the difference with D terms here? Why is it that they're retained? They're not. They're not so, you have Dirac Genos, but the uh, structure of these models is very different from the normal uh, 
as super soft yeah. construction. Yeah. So you, you get a you get a soft mass for the adjoints that would adjust to cancel the d terms uh, without getting a you you get a soft mass for them, but it doesn't feed in uh, radiatively with a large value to the Higgs potential. So oh. you kind of solve that tension. I see. And it yeah, and you don't. It kind of happens all at once. Is maybe the nice thing about these models. Okay. Good. So, uh, let me show you some results finally. Uh, so on this plot, I have the scale one over r for the model I've been describing in TV. Uh, the mass of the z prime that's associated with this extra u one in a model where I fix up the Higgs mass with a non decoupling d term. Uh, I have dashed lines are contours of the stop mass. So uh, this is around 700 GeV. Uh, and the solid lines are contours of tuning. Uh, and so what I find is that current limits where I haven't played any games of hiding, just put them at the limits. So 700 GeV stop and a couple TeV gluinos and squirts. I'm at tuning of 50% uh, uh, if I were using the normal kind of GDK barbarian measure. Uh, so that, Say, but at current limits, these models aren't really tuned. This hierarchy that's built in is enough to make the spectrum compatible with current limits and the idea of naturalness. Uh, after LHC 13, you'll be sitting around 10% uh, tuned. Uh, so, you, know, you might say it's maximal because you're kind of saturating the naivest one loop between <coughs> estimate that you would uh, have a top contribution cutoff at the scale of your limits for new colored particles. So that's good. We have a natural model. Okay, so that's uh, that's how you uh, protect a natural, you easily set up a natural SUSY model of geography, and then that same uh, fact that I used a 5D model to set up my natural supersymmetry also protects me at loop level and lets me re realize a spectrum where I have a splitting between Guinos, stops, and Higgs, which is exactly what I want to reconcile at current OFC limits with. Uh, naturalness. Okay, so uh, that's great. You know, I've added a lot of stuff to do this. So uh, you know, I think it's interesting to explore this direction. You win on tuning, you've added complexity in model, uh, and it's interesting to look at, does this motivate any other signatures uh, for naturalness that we're not looking for? So let me talk a little bit about the LHC phenomenology of these models. Uh, so I'll talk first a little bit about the uh, standard thing that can happen, and then some unusual things that can happen. OK, so uh, just to summarize the crucial features of the spectrum, uh, I'm going to be, because the Gleenos, Neutralinos, Higginos are all heavy at around three to five times the stop mass, uh, I'm not going to worry about them. I'm just going to worry about the color production of the uh, third generation spermions. Uh, an important feature of these models is that there doesn't have to be a Higgsino in this low energy spectrum. Right, because the Higgs uh, was able to naturally be lifted to the scale of <coughs> to one of our R. Uh, so that's nice. That kind of, you know, in any other MSM motivated natural SUSY spectrum, you would have a Higgs Zeno playing an important role in the decays uh, that are happening of these third generation states. Okay, and then I haven't told you what the LSP is yet. There's a few different options. Uh, so, uh, simplest possibility is that, at least on collider scales, the Left handed. I just ask a question about the Higgs zero. In the normal yeah. formula for M Z squared, there's always this Higgs zero mass squared. Yeah, the mu squared, yes. Yeah. In it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, what corrects? What is the correction to that formula that allows it to make mu squared large? And yeah, so good. So automatically get M Z squared. Where does it come from? Yeah, so for, so it's technically natural. Just take that mu squared term and cancel it with a P mu or soft mass term. Uh, it turns out in these models that the point where that happens has an enhanced symmetry. So you have an extra R symmetry and an extra U1 Higgs symmetry at that point. So it's a special value of parameters when you write it in that language. And how this shows up in the boundary condition language is that I've just chosen a set of simple boundary conditions that gives me a relationship between those two parameters. Mm -hmm. right? but yeah, I would say, yeah, you would be worried that this is a tuning, but I, it's because there's an extra symmetry of the model at this point, it's. There's a, a moral reason why you have this relationship at the scale one of R between the mu term and the soft terms. Right. Okay, so let's talk about what the LSP might be. Uh, so simplest possibility is that uh, 
it's only really only these third generation brain located states that are rel relevant for cladder phenomenology. Uh, then you might have, you know, simple example would be this neutrino, uh, third generation neutrino is the LSP. So this is one possibility. Uh, another possibility is that this, so the Goldstino of the Sherrick Schwartz Susie breaking, or the radion, you know, uh, radion, is uh, eaten by gravitino, it gets mass 1 over 2r. But when you have an extra uh, source of brain localized Susie breaking, you can get a pseudo Goldstino, so you can have a light neutral state associated with this. Uh, these models. So that's another possibility. And that actually gives, ends up giving you phenomenology that's uh, fairly similar to just kind of vanilla natural Susie models. Uh, and then a third possibility is that I complete the gravity silence theory with a large extra dimensions theory where the extra dimensions are relevant on collider scales. Uh, and then my LSP can uh, generically be a bulk state uh, and I can be sufficiently strongly coupled that the lightest third generation state on the brain decays to this bulk state. And that has some very interesting phenomenology. Okay, so let me talk about this vanilla case really quick. Uh, so here you just, you really just decay, you know, the stock will decay directly to the top and this light partner that uh, has a mass scale uh, effectively in the massless region of the, of the plots. So this is kind of the version of model where the normal SUSY limits apply directly, the normal natural SUSY limits apply directly. Uh, and of course, you know, there are other decays that can happen, but these have a uh, fairly small branching fraction in this, in this part of parameter space. Okay. So this is just nice that it, it really maps directly to the vanilla natural SUSY models that we have good experimental searches for. Uh, this second possibility of having a left handed neutrino LSP uh, has some kind of uh, interesting features. So here you normally have three body case with these off shell neutrinos. <coughs> uh, and yeah, because you don't have the light exino, you get uh, kind of a different set of signatures. Uh, so, uh, and in theory, you'll get three body case. For instance, the stop will go to the top and neutrinos neutrino, or stop will go to the bottom tau neutrino. Uh, so you, you have these final states that are at tau and B rich. Uh, and can have reduced missing energy because I either have many because I have many particles, uh, basically in the final state. Uh, so this can uh, reduce uh, limits from kind of your naive 700 GV for superpartners, uh, and we're studying a little bit how much the limits are reduced in these, uh, and if there's any better way to look for these to cover these tau and B final states. Okay, so that's something that's not really motivated in the normal uh, natural Susie picture. Uh, okay, and then the final uh, interesting thing I'd like to talk about is what happens if I decay to some bulk gravitational states. Okay, so uh, this is kind of picture that I have my 5D brain with a scale uh, of 1 over a TV that my 5D Sherrick Schwartz model lives on, and I have a large uh, extra bulk with size I want it to be relative, relevant to colliders, so uh, inverse size less than around 10 GB. Uh, and the, this 5D model I've been discovering so far is just localized on this brain. And it's only the gravitational or maybe some extra bulk states that propagate this side of it. Okay, and in fact, this is uh, maybe a little bit more generic than just uh, this shared force model, but you can imagine uh, <coughs> completing any uh, MSM, 4D MSM model to, at some scale to a theory where gravity propagates in large dimensions. So I can, Imagine MSSM is on a, some effective three brain in a large extra dimensional bulk. Okay, uh, so uh, you know generally there will be bulk states, so there's a definitely a bulk gravitino in these models, and then there might be other states of so axino or fotino. Uh, and if so, Susie breaking has to be close to the MSSM brain, but it doesn't have to spread throughout this entire large gravitational bulk. So if it does not, then the bulk states will generically stay light uh, because they can propagate far away from the loca location of Susie brain. So generically, the LSP will be one of these bulk states. Uh, and so if we have conserved R parity, all of my brain localized states are eventually, so all my MSM states are eventually going to decay to one of these bulk states. Okay, so why is this interesting? Uh, so if I look at it from the KK picture and just look at the spectrum of these bulk states, uh, they're going to have a very small mass from Susie breaking, so let me just uh, ignore that for the moment. 
and say there's, I just have a normal tower for a massless state, uh, then what happens is that I will, first of all, I have a continuum of states, so I always have many states below the mass of my, uh, the mass of the lightest brain localized state. I have many bulk states that have lighter masses. And uh, if I have more than one extra dimension, so I have some large co-dimension bulk, then the density of these states will scale like the mass to d minus one, right? Just the phase space density of these states. So uh, when I couple these states, there are many, many more states that I can decay to that are uh, at heavier masses. So I will like to go to the heaviest state <coughs> that I can uh, kinematically access uh, in this tower just by the bulk phase space factor. Uh, so what you have is you have a competition that uh, kinematics on the brain prefer you to go uh, the phase space on the brain prefers you to go to lighter KK states, but this can be overwhelmed by the uh, phase space factor in the bulk, so the phase space in the bulk, which wants you to go to heavier states. Okay, so what will happen is uh, you can just compute as a function of the extra dimension uh, what types of shapes you get for these distributions. So I've plotted, uh, this is the ratio of the mass of the KK state that I K2 to the mass of the mother particle on the brain. Uh, it's just the differential cross-section. And uh, this is for a particular coupling that's not important, uh, which is some kind of bulk state. Uh, and as a function of dimension, this is peaked at a higher and higher value. And kind of all these are around uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 of the uh, mother particle mass. So this is for, uh, say, a stop decaying to a top in one of these bulk states directly. OK, so what does this do? Uh, well. I know that we have great limits on superpartners uh, decaying to missing energy and their thermal partners uh, when the neutral LSP is not too heavy. But when the neutral LSP uh, starts to get heavy, then these limits start decreasing, right? Uh, there's some turnover point uh, where once I make the uh, LSP close to degenerate with the uh, lightest superpartner that's decaying to it, uh, then I suppress my missing energy signals and I start hiding this from our searches. Uh, so there's this kind of region uh, where you might expect that if most of your decays look like they're fitting in this region, then you'll start eroding limits. So we went ahead and recast some, oh, where is that? Yeah, so we went ahead and recast some results for this. So this is assuming that you're still decaying promptly to these states. Uh, and yeah, we find that uh, this can have an interesting effect. So for example, uh, you get the biggest effect you get is for d equals 6. Uh, you can take the stop limits from 700 GB to around 400 GB. Uh, try it just It's kind of you're dynamically realizing a compressed spectrum. So I haven't tuned any masses to lie near each other. That's just a, a feature of the phase space for a small that I get uh, suppressed missing energy signatures in the case. <coughs> okay, and then uh, as you have fewer extra dimensions, you get less of a phase space factor enhancing your decays and you uh, start looking more like just the massless LSP limit. OK, so that's one interesting thing is that, you know, but we, that 13 TV LHC is about to turn on. So we should be optimistic and not just worry about what we might have hidden. Uh, so there's one fun possibility is that maybe we'll turn the 13 TV LHC on and see long-lived uh, colored particles or long-lived charged particles. Right? So this would be exciting. Uh, it could be discovery of supersymmetry. Uh, and in this context, there's also another possibility that you know these particles generically stop in detectors when you produce them. Uh, and for some range of parameters, uh, they can have decays that you could observe <coughs> later in the in the detector, uh, you know, seconds or days or years uh, after they're produced and stopped in the detector. Uh, so people studied this right for our hadrons in the split supersymmetry <coughs> case and long with Stows. Uh, so this is uh, pretty well studied. Uh, the interesting thing here is that, you know, say we are in some kind of extra dimensional setup, then the decays of these long-lived states have to go into the bulk. And so you might hope that you would measure some properties of this bulk, even if the fundamental scale is much higher than we usually think about being able to access at colliders. So you know, normal direct contact operator searches or direct production of bulk states at the LHC cuts off around 10 TeV, these limits. But here, because you have this window into the bulk, uh, through these, uh, through a long-lived state, you might imagine that you could get to any uh, displaced 
you can find information about decays into any displaced or stopped particle. So that could correspond to fundamental scales that are much, much larger than 10 TeV uh, up to maybe you know, 10 to the 6 TeV. Okay, would so this, be, yeah. Would there be some like cosmological constraints like you have things decay? Yeah, so there's, yes, there's, there's definitely constraints. On, so the constraints on cosmology aren't uh, significantly changed. The, the worst constraints on, this, on cosmology in these models are on reheat and producing these uh, just yeah, the bulk KK modes of standard right. mm -hmm. of the graviton and things like that, right? Yeah. So you don't the limits don't get significantly worse in these models from those limits, but yeah, there are there's you, you need to do a low temperature reheat mm. okay. to make cosmology work in these models. Um, but yeah, we're being optimistic. Uh, so obviously you find uh, these stop particles and then I start looking at their decays and Right, and I, so you can imagine people have proposals for that you might be able to build uh, stopper detectors uh, or uh, special do special uh, late vertex searches or even uh, find kinematic information about decays in the detector. So it might be that you can actually reconstruct some of this information about these decays. And so this would give you an interesting probe. Uh, you know, you measure the lifetime, you get the scale of the extra dimension. You measure this kind of distribution. You in principle, determine the number of extra dimensions. So it's kind of an interesting possibility for a probe into so large we'll extra dimensions, but with a much higher fundamental scale than you would traditionally think is accessible at colliders. So, so yeah, little here. d is the number of extra dimensions. Little d is, yeah, the code dimension. So six yeah. is something. Yeah. I thought the information here is they are all pretty close to each other. So, so, so you say we might be able, of course, optimistically. Yes, all, yes, yeah. I mean, there, there's there's information, yeah, there's information about the structure of the extra dimensions in these, and they are different from each other. Uh, uh, you, yeah, you can also, these shapes change also if you change the couplings, of, so depending on which bulk state you're coupling to. Uh, so yeah, I, you, the information is there, the question is whether you can, it depends on how lucky you are, whether you uh, collect enough of these, and how well you can build a detector. Yeah. Yeah. But this, this is the most optimistic result I can imagine uh, for this kind of model, is that we turn on the LHC, find uh, charged stable particles, discover supersymmetry, and then probe a uh, large extra dimension with a fundamental scale of 10 to the 8 TV. So everyone hold your breath and <laughs> wait for this to happen. Uh, okay, so let me conclude. Uh, so basic idea for these models is they're motivated by reconciling the experimental little hierarchy, just that we've observed that stops need to be heavier than 700 GV unless I play tricks to hide them. Uh, and glinos need to be pretty heavy also. Uh, so we're reconciling that with naturalness. And we studied a set of models where SUSY breaking uh, is communicated to uh, the engaged Higgs and first and second generation super partners uh, because of the propagation through a TV sized bulk. So this had a nice feature that. Uh, locality let us set up a tree level, a natural spectrum, and then also protected us uh, at loop level. So we really maintain this large natural hierarchy and scales in the theory. Uh, then we had to do the normal tricks to get 125 GB Higgs, of course. Uh, then we looked at the phenomenology. So, you know, kind of the vanilla phenomenology is to, dominated by the earliest, I guess the earliest collider accessible states in these series are the third generation spermulons because they're uh, they're light, and they're light for the reason of naturalists. So if you're testing naturalists, that's what you expect to see in these. And this is different in that you uh, really expect a hierarchy with the Guino in these models, and you uh, can have heavy Higgs so you won't see Higgs Xenos playing a role in the decays of these light states. Uh, and then finally, uh, thinking about this kind of extra dimensional setup uh, also motivates maybe thinking about uh, different contexts where you have large gravitational dimensions, uh, and you can serve that pair you see of uh, interesting new possible signatures and uh, mechanisms for hiding superpartners with a dynamical compressed spectrum uh, through decaying to these gravitational bulks. Okay, so uh, soon we will finish our longer version of our paper <laughs> on all of this, uh, and there's some more details about uh, different ways of getting the Higgs mass. Uh, another one of uh, Sarah's students is working on unification in these models. Uh, and there's maybe some interesting future work you can vary which spectra that from a phenomenological point of view is kind of interesting to look at 
putting different sets of particles on the brains and bulk and seeing if that motivates any different signatures. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. you want to say anything about gauge unification? What's the idea there? Uh, do I want to... So you can't make SU5 work if they are doing some kind of unification. It's a, the simplest version... Uh, yeah, this, the simplest version, you get um, SU2, you get electronic unification. <coughs> but what, I mean, how do you even, I mean, you have this, uh, you're doing some kind of low-scale unification. Mm -hmm. right? you, yeah, yeah, so it's through the extra-dimensional running, yeah. So it's, in fact, it's, uh, it goes to a 6D model in their simplest version. Okay. But yeah, yeah, they use the power law running in the extra dimensions. And then, the t yeah, you don't get, of course, you, this normal thing. So you have, because you have supersymmetry, right, you have a hierarchy in scale, so the fundamental scale is far away from 1 over R, but you still have the, uh, you know, the, you have the brain localized operators. Uh, that and I thought pop, I mean, power law running is threshold correction, so it's not yes, really yeah. calculable. So yeah, so uh, if you can, yeah, if so you can you're complete. Losing, you're not, you're not, when you say, I mean, there are two senses of unification. One is that just the UV sense that you're compatible with some gut. But there's the other sense, which is that there's this amazing coincidence in the MSSM extrapolated up to the gut scale. And are you, are you explaining that? Or no, it's, yeah, it's, not, not, it's not near as predictive as MSSM unification, right. or uh, as testable as MSSM right. unification in that sense. Uh, you do have more control if you go to an, an equals four or three. Uh, so I, th I think uh, so. I'm not actually I'm not working on this, but I, I think their story is that you go to a 60 n equals four in the end, and that gives you a little bit more control. Any question? So in this scheme, in terms of the Higgs couplings, mm -hmm. are they within what percentage of? standard model like? Are they all extremely standard? Model yeah, I don't think you would. Uh, because you don't have large A terms in this model and you don't have very light states, you don't expect very large loop corrections. So I, I don't think it would be within. I, I, yeah, I don't think you expect corrections. And you, you can easily, uh, you can really decouple the extra MSM pick states without affecting the tuning. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I don't think you expect multiple deviations at LHC. Do you have any, any favorite uh, dark matter story from these models? No, cosmology is complicated in these. Well, this, cosmology is complicated if you believe in the large extra dimension UV completion. Uh, if you are want to do something like a little string theory UV completion, something that doesn't have large extra dimensions that can be relevant for cosmology. Uh, then the simplest dark matter is actually the H down can be an inert Higgs doublet dark matter, and that can work. Um, so this extreme tan beta. So H down. So you have to, yeah, you have to have no new power coupling. But right, you don't, yeah, so you, you actually, you can have a U1 H down or a, or a discrete symmetry protecting the H down. Do you even need H down in this model? You uh, you can, yeah, so if you remove H down, then you, uh, then you generate uh, these brain localized uh, finally all those terms that give you, uh, so yeah, you generate these UV sensitive brain waves by Eliopoulos terms that are, uh, generate a parity odd mass for the Higgs. Uh, so no, you can't, yeah, it wrecks things. Any other question? No? If not, that's since Kyle. Yeah.